One it's that's only one. ever on Bathypathies. <gasps> kind of Pink looks similar, lobster, right? Huh? Yeah, I can't tell from the texture if it's spiny or not. It, I think it just might be darker. This one, yeah. You can see how it has its uh, some appendages that kind of hooks onto the uh, this main stem of the colony. Go wide. Off the coral back there. Yeah, another anthemastus in the background. Cool. Are we witnessing infidelity between? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I kind of think so. That would be pretty noteworthy. If we can get another view of him. It it blows my mind sometimes to think about these crabs. They probably land on this colony when it's very, oh, very, very, very young or younger. And they stay with it for life and kind of just whatever food comes along, you hope you get a meal once in a while. And uh, that's it. There's no There's no foraging. You're like, you're stuck here. They don't even come home that is pretty wild yeah. you have to like hope you picked a good coral do you have any idea how long those those can live i don't i don't know okay, at all let's try again uh go for zoom i think i think it's pretty hard to uh, date how old a lot of different kinds of crustaceans are because I don't think they leave very good um, records that we can use to age them. Okay, I need to catch up. Sorry, guys. I wish oh, I could have gotten great. a better shot for you. So they must molt, right? Because they grow. Yeah, yeah. So their skeleton is not very useful for aging because it changes every pick an interval. I don't know. Um, you know, whenever they get big enough. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some research, I know, into like shallow water lobsters may have small crystalline structures in their uh, inside their bodies that may be age dated. So maybe the crustaceans in the deep sea have something similar, but not sure. Have you ever seen molted shells while exploring around these? Seasons? No, I have not. Uh, that is a really interesting note. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, like in shallow water crustaceans down here, if they molt, they probably consume their shell mm. um, because it's a pretty significant source of energy. Um, and usually you know, they, they need those resources back uh, to produce and regrow their next layer. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. Bridge snap. 100 meters, 
Okay. Like one of the uh So this Chrysogorgia colony, um, we actually have sampled in the past from this part of the Pacific, and uh, we've barcoded it, and it's most closely related to something called Chrysogorgia abluto, and it actually might be that species, which was originally described from the Atlantic, North Atlantic. Oh. So it's um, pro possibly a cosmopolitan species. What does that mean, a cosmopolitan species? means that they're found all over the world, all over the oceans. Not necessarily in every ocean, but they're very, very widespread. They have the capacity to, to spread all over the world. Are most of these other corals we're seeing, then we've only seen them in the Pacific? Yeah, or? other other species might be more regional um, or, you know, kind of basin scale distributions. But I think this is the, one of the ones that is uh, widespread. You know, we see a lot of, well, from what we can tell, they're, they're widespread. You know, as technology improves and we have better and better abilities to sequence DNA and look at you know, different structures and their morphology, okay, we learn more things about, you know, maybe being able to split them up into smaller and smaller units. But for the most part, um, the data supports that it's it's one species for now. I don't know if any samples have been specifically sequenced from uh, around Hawaii, but the ones that we've sampled from a bit further south um, suggests yeah, sim similar to a Bluto or similar, uh, very closely related. We sampled a, quite a few of those sparse branchers uh, earlier this summer uh, on a Falcor cruise we were on. Hmm. So you were on Falcor this summer? Yeah. yeah we had a really huh. excellent cruise down to, from Honolulu out to the uh, U.S. Phoenix Islands at Howland and Baker. We also sampled and surveyed some um, high seas seamounts between here and there. How much of this past year, then, have you been out in the Pacific? Can you repeat the question? How much of this past year have you been out in the Pacific um, doing this research? I think all in all, by the end of this year, it'll be about three months at sea. It's yeah, definitely one of my heavier years. Yeah, that's a good chunk. They're long cruises, right? Because it's, it takes a long time to get out to where you need to mm -hmm. go, and then you know, usually have two weeks of operations, and then time to get back. Mm. Nice angular rock there. <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, we had we had thought we were going to be the last cruise um, before Falcor retired and went to the shop for Fal to become Falcor Two, 
but um, there were a couple more cruises, and now I believe the ship is headed to Europe for uh, transferring. Oh, wow. Big move. Yeah. They run a very similar YouTube channel during their dives. Very vibrant community over there. Mm -hmm. Scientists ashore and interested citizen scientists. Moves are looking pretty strange, huh? Yeah, we're getting their little the seas again. Oh, okay. Little bumps. I think it will straighten out though. Okay. Eye on it. We, can we look at this thing over here? I uh, almost miss, almost missed it. Yeah, this this to me looks more like a genus called. Alternatopathies. Yes. Yeah, if it ends in pathies, yeah. That com comes from the group name for the black corals, the Antipatheria. Which actually, um, if you literally translate it, I learned this a few years ago, is kind of really surprising to me. Um, Antipatheria means against you know, disease. Um, so they were historically used as kind of like pseudo pharmaceuticals, huh. antipatheria. Oh yeah, yeah, you can get them within uh, free diving depths around Hawaii. What was your question, Gabby? Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't hey, on you're, SPL. You okay? I was just curious about. Uh, whether you could get them at shallower depths than here. It just uh. seems like a lot of work. If you're going to be using it as a medicine. <laughs> <like> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sure, you know, I believe you can find them in um, kind of these tropical latitudes at shallower depths. They form quite substantial colonies. These ones are more fine, mm -hmm. finely constructed in the deep sea. Yeah, but the, like, like the precious corals, they've also been exploited for uh, jewelry. Uh, the black protein skeleton can be carved into different kinds of jewelry. Okay.
There's a, our white squat lobster friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Unidopsis. They were actually pretty abundant on one dive last uh, cruise, where they were all kind of perched on this uh, you know, sponge stalk or something okay. in this manner. Really long rostrum, really um, strong spine that comes out between the eyes. Very diagnostic of certain species. I'm always thankful for these sea cucumbers for like a little pop of color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cucumbers do have some of the most amazing colors. Uh, I don't know if it's just the, the pigment combined with their translucent. I almost feel like one day we'll have a paint at Home Depot or something called Polythurian <laughs> Purple. <laughs> That's a good idea. I think that would sell better than sea cucumber. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Did anyone see the news about the color of the year for 2022? Oh, what is year. it? I didn't know this was a thing. Go for Zoom. Right. Bathy pathies, orange. What's the color of the year? Um. <laughs> Don't leave us hanging, Can I Steve. Go wide? Yeah, that was <laughs> the color of the year. The it, there. It's, I mean, I would call it purple, but also, I, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not very uh, precise. So I the feel official like it always has a yeah, like a fancier name, right? Yeah, uh, uh, it's more like a lavender, I guess. But the official color name is very Perry. Very Perry. Yeah, yeah Perry but like referencing, yeah, to Periwinkle. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Lavender I only know that because I'm also Googling it. <laughs> okay. Don't actually know that. You're not supposed to tell that part. <laughs> I have two two questions. What are they? <laughs> First question. Who decides this? <laughs> and should we care? <laughs> I mean, the second question is very much dependent on the first one, I think. And isn't periwinkle blue? Kind of a purp light purple. Like purpley blue. Can we look at the sea star on the right hand side on that rock? Yes. I did not see that. Good eyes. Go for zoom. So who decides this? Um I'll look that Apparently up. Apparently it's a it's a company called Pantone. And they choose a color of the year based on design trends it sees throughout in different industries. Uh -huh. And they've been doing this since 1999. Hmm. Sounds more like the color of last year. What's the up? Yeah, I guess maybe it is based on that. A few years ago, I think it was um, something coral was the color and it was kind of like this uh, kind of precious coral color, like light red. I almost need like a color book, color palette to describe these colors better. Yeah, coral could mean so many things. But for some reason it's that like pinky orange. Mm -hmm. If you use like um like paints or something like that, those sets of those color names are pretty standardized. Those are the that's the only color set I really know, but I find them to be pretty standardized. Bridge, nah. They move one hundred meters one six zero.
So the second part of that question, should we care? I don't know. It's <laughs> up to you. Sorry to be grumpy like that. <laughs> do you care about design trends? Well, maybe you do. Then. Go for Zoom. Living Coral, that was it. Thank you. Living Coral was 2019. Living Coral. Probably best that it's living coral because dead coral does not look very good. Yeah, it's a weird green color or whatever. Oh, I'm thinking of dead sponge. That would also not be a great. Yeah, dead sponge. <laughs> That's actually, 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 I can see that being a very popular color. Look at the color of the like. Yeah. What are the what are the little guys that grow on the? Okay, go ahead. The, those little like five yeah. hairs that are coming yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are actually foraminiferans. So those are single-celled protists. They form these trees. <laughs> yeah. And they grow a lot on dead sponges, right? Yeah. Noid. Back into the nodules. Smaller ones, though. The ones down deeper were a bit bigger. But definitely, you can see what's kind of well, well placed in the side of the seamount versus what's loose. The larger corals and sponges will preferentially settle on some of the larger stuff. Go for zoom. I feel like that's that rock is n was not a good bet for this sponge, but yeah. it's making it work so far. Good enough, right? Yeah. It looks like the sponge has lived mo most of its life, and now it's just fading away, getting all clogged up with sediment and deep sea gunk. Little tiny brittle star on there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so cute. Okay, go in. I These sponges? If, oh. Oh, no, I was just wondering if the brittle stars are actually doing a positive function by eating some of the debris that might be accumulating on the sponge. Was some of that debris foraminiferans there? Yeah, it starts to starts to become foraminiferans, yeah. I was going to ask, yeah, as filter feeders, do sponges have any way of, like, themselves cleaning out anything that might kind of gunk up? Um, yeah, I guess yes. that's my main question. Yes, the, the answer that? is yes. <laughs> um, there's actually a video of this um, from, uh, I think it might have been Ambari did a, a video on sponges sneezing. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, which is basically a, <laughs> kind of a reversal of flow and it just like, whoosh, all the all the sediment gets... Um, expelled and then, yeah, that, that, it was filmed off of California for sure. I don't know, remember exactly the. They group can that reverse did that. their flow. That's yeah. crazy. That's so cool. Sudden reversal of flow. Sponge wow. sneeze. We're going to have to watch that YouTube later. I mean, it wouldn't make very much sense if you just had like one go and then if you get gunked up, that's it. That's true. So they must have some sort of strategy. <laughs> but they're like not a 
they don't appear to be a very complicated critter with a lot of different types of structures. They look like they have one type of structure. Yeah. Which is the spicules, right? Yep. And they managed to do a lot with that. Yeah. Got a primnoid fan, a Chrysogorgia fan, and a black coral, Bathypathies here. Seems to be the typical species we're seeing now in this community. Uh, oh, there's also some Heteropathies too. In the lower left corner here, that's Heteropathies Americana. Oh, okay, cool. Yep. Four coral species here. Neat. Yeah, typically, you know, from what I've noticed so far, the bigger the boulder we've come across, the more diversity there is. So that there could be something to that, you know, having a larger space uh, with better flow conditions, better substrate stability results in more species and more diverse species. Mm -hmm. What's this? What are you? Go for zoom. Black coral. Heteropathies? Mm hmm Okay, go ahead. Underwater trombone. <laughs> you can always do musical instruments when you get tired of food. I like that. I see the trombone. Mm -hmm. Also known as the lettuce sponge. <laughs> Last year, we uh, did have some extended exploration opportunities in the, or I don't know if it was in the Channel Island Sanctuary, but nearby, where we found um, these large glass sponge reefs. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's become published yet, but it, they were substantial, uh, tens of meters tall. Wow. I remember that's that. incredible. They went on for. Hundreds and hundreds oh, yeah, they of were years too, right? incredibly long. Yeah. Small snail. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, those, I have those to are go. The, I'm sorry. Those are the four minute friends there. Nice fly in there. Yeah, that was I a nice. Wasn't touching anything. It was a great, great shot. But thank you. Do less. Say less. <laughs> Say <think> less. <laughs> all the sponge reefs were made out of one genus, too. It was, I think, Ferrea. Um, I'm not sure of the species, but yeah. Just the reef was all one species? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, just, just the tops of the reef were live, but there was a ton of reef uh, sponge rubble. Wow.
Who would be working out on the deck at 2 in the morning? <laughs> Actually, they have the floodlights up. I think they are doing something okay. uh, forward of the control vans. Okay. It's another type of sponge, maybe another furia, furia species or something else. At least probably in the same family, furia D. Go for zoom. Not that genus. The macaroni sponge. Yeah, I love these. That's really cool. I think this might be my top sponge. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's a good sponge. Go ahead. Sponges sneeze. <laughs> the lesson of today. I know. I'm so excited to see I know, this video. I'm, there's probably a name for it. But did you just come up with the idea that it's a sneeze? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, that's yeah. what it looks like to me because it's sudden. It's a sudden ejection of a lot of sediment. Okay. It's not a slow process. I mean, you can't. Sponges aren't notorious for their ability to do things quickly, but yeah. this one uh, actually is. Yeah, what does quickly mean for a sponge? So I'll have to find the video. That, that sounds like a uh, philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like, like a Zen puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm still like, I'm still sort of having trouble wrapping my head around the idea that sponges do anything, <laughs> you know? What with them only being made of like strands of glass. What have the sponges ever done for us? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot, actually. Yeah, a lot, actually. Lots of things. Are, sponges are great sources of um, compounds, pharmaceutical compounds. Yeah. They, uh, they have unique evolutionary lineages that you know, they every if you think about it everything in the deep sea has evolved in this place to be this species or another and uh, oh, all of that genetic code is unique to that animal living in that place and so when we talk about marine genetic resources we aren't always talking about the physical compounds themselves but rather the the DNA that codes for the proteins that produce that compound. It's a very interesting wow. texture, structure. This is also another frayed. Russell sprout? Okay, go yeah. away. Russell yeah, sprout. What, Time to catch up. What might make that, oh, it kind of looked like bony almost, you know? Is that just the spicules in a new formation that makes it look kind of yeah, darker? Some, some sort of formation like that. Yep. Growth pattern. Hmm. Oh, yeah, we might have our first precious coral, too. Where, where, where? Uh, to the right-hand side, just off screen. Mm. Right on just target, around 2,000 meters. Just beneath the laser there. That's cool. That's pretty incredible. You called that. Go for zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Almost you never like know when they're going to appear. In deep sea oh, yeah? yeah. Yeah, that's what that is. How did you catch that? That's amazing. Okay, I gotta go. Yeah. You start to, you know, pick things out. Um, you start to see various different reference panes when you move through the seafloor on an ROV video. Um, yeah. You know, certain objects move certain ways. The colors are extremely helpful, too. There was, that looked like a different coral to me, like one of those sort of like bottle brushy ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a hemichorallium, most likely. Okay, I looked up, I tried to look up what some of these like scientific names mean. So there's hexachorallia, which was, is the six-sided one. Yep. There's octocorals, 
Actocorallia. Yep. What's Hemicorallia? So Hemicorallium is a genus in the precious coral family. The Coralliidae is the family. Okay. And it, it belongs with the Octocorallia. Oh, okay. There are some other sub subgroupings under the Octocorallia, but above family, um, that denote certain types of skeletal compositions. But um, we don't typically use those since they're kind of vague um, for the purposes of doing seafloor video annotation like this. Oh, okay. So there's the Sclerexonia, the Holexonia, uh, those two major groups. Go for Zoom. Like there's a lobster on the other side of this guy. Well, it looks like it. Yeah, you can see arms. Yep. <laughs> there he is. Flexing back there. I think there's a little shrimp on there too. Oh, and shrimp. Yep. Is it loaded up? So that the other groups um, underneath the octocorals are the uh, Elcianina, so those are the true soft corals. Um, also includes mushroom corals. The Calcexonians, which are most of what we've seen today, the primnoids, chrysogorgids, bamboos. Polexonians, uh, which we haven't seen yet today, but the plexorids and the acanthogorgids and the sclerexonians, which are uh, what we just saw, the precious corals, bamboo, or uh, precious corals and uh, bubblegum corals, things like that. They all have different skeletal uh, morphologies, compositions. They all have different compositions? Yeah, uh, so sometimes the mineralogy is different between these groups. Um, so, for example, the, with the, the Holexonians, um, their uh, skeleton uh, is a mixture of protein, uh, gorgonin, which gives it flexibility, but also they have small calcium carbonate uh, uh, sclerites in their tissues. Whereas uh, some of the other ones are made out of, you know, they're either calcite or aragonite, there are some aragonitic octocorals. Aragonite is usually in the, the stony corals. Mm -hmm. like That's the thing very you can small use to age them? Jelly fish. Where? Right oh, yep, here. yep, yep, yep. Oh my gosh. Okay. Good spot. Give me a zoom. Oh. <laughs> it looks like a little leaf. What is that? It's yeah, can we follow that? I can sure try. It's so flat. Or it looks fine for me. Yeah, it's very unusual. Is that even alive? Like a it's little a UFO. frisbee floating through the ocean. Sorry, this is not my best work here. We're moving Can't faster even identify than he that. is. Purple leaf. It, it doesn't look like it's in control. It kind of looks like yeah. almost debris. Zoom.
I don't even feel like there's anything to learn about it. <laughs> yeah. It's... Okay. Huh. Oh, is it a purple orb? Is it, or is it flat? I have no idea. It looks I flat. Can't even tell. It's definitely flat. Okay. Go wide. It's a mystery. Those things fast. Here. The things that we just don't know what they are. Yeah, fast that's the pretty most. funny. Yeah, I wish the slurp was working. I would totally go after that. Zoom, zoom. We had a, on this M cruise I was talking about earlier, we found some really bizarre, we called it rock snot. Um, <laughs> but it was, it wasn't a sponge that we know about. It wasn't a tunicate. It wasn't microbial mat. Something we found in a very bizarre texture this summer. Uh, so we sampled some of it. I don't even know if it's organic in nature. <laughs> oh, man. So what do you do that, like, if it's got genetic material, you can you sequence it? Yeah, yeah. So we took some and preserved it for genetic sequencing. Haven't done that yet, but uh, that's usually the first step. It's so cheap now to do genetic sequencing that we really? can probably get some kind of... How do you determine whether something has genetic material? Like, um, You can, so you could uh, extract its DNA using a commercial kit, and then um, you can put a tiny little drop of that extract on a, um, a spectrophotometer, and you can get approximate concentrations of nucleic acids. Okay. Got it. Cool. It's kind of like a... It, it, it's tough. The, there's many different types of these types of spectrophotometers. Um, sometimes we call them nanodrops. Uh, it can detect nano, nanograms per microliter of nucleic acids. Although more than more often than not, that's just a random number number generator. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the most reliable tools in the lab. <laughs> Do they at least tell you when they're generating random numbers? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> That's one of those um, overly honest methods. Oh, yeah. I do love that tag. There's a surprising uh, percentage of those overly honest methods that have to do with coffee and coffee machines. Yeah. What do you mean by overly honest? Steve? Yeah, so uh, how, how do I put this without making it sound random? <laughs> um, so if, if, you're, if you have a methodology, right, um, and say your methodology says incubate for you know, 60 minutes or something, uh -huh. sometimes the methodology we develop uh, you know, might not have a particularly, you know, strong evidence for why we chose that time, but it could be something like, oh, we incubated at 60 minutes because that's how long we went out for lunch for. Mm. And, uh, you know, that, that could be a, an example. Um, overly honest, but, you know, still grounded in truth. Right. Mm. Uh, and other examples would be things like, all of our millions of dollars of lab equipment is useless without our $20 coffee machine. Yep. Um, and it's just a, it's a Twitter hashtag. It's quite see. humorous I if see. you spend a lot of time in a basement lab. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, deep, when it, whatever you do use deep sea exploration data, it's a bit of an overly honest method because you never know what kind of data you're going to get. You just kind of have to work with what you have. So, you know, why is the dive, why were the dives six, eight, and, you know, 17 hours long? Well, that's, that's kind of how long we could stay on the bottom before the ship lost station. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's an overly honest method. <laughs> that is a good one. I would enjoy reading that one somewhere. <laughs> We have to work with the data we have uh, sometimes. And you know, the data is just so sparsely um, collected out here when we do exploration that we kind of have to make it work. 
So we use various statistics to make it more robust. Yeah, yeah. I spent five years of my life trying to make exploration. You know, if in an ideal world, you know, if we were doing seamount ecology or seamount biogeography, we might want to do like five or six transects up. You know, all the different sides of the seamounts, so we can get a good idea of how uh, spatially heterogeneous diverse the different communities are but in reality sometimes all we get is one uh, transect like in these seamounts so we have to do some inferences but you know it doesn't mean just because we don't have five transects and have good coverage over all sides of the seamount doesn't mean we can't say something uh, meaningful about what's going on down here yeah I just have to find the support for it statistically yeah the ocean is always undersampled. <laughs> I was on a cruise once with a bunch of forestry scientists who were just visiting to see how things go. And forestry scientists, when they want to put um, instrumentation out, they walk out into the woods and they put the instrumentation there. And when it breaks, they walk out and they fix it. And uh, we were in the Southern Ocean you know, with like one or two moorings for the entire area. You know, every few years you get to go service them if they break. If they break before then, then you just don't have that data. They were totally astonished with how incredibly difficult it is to do any sampling in the ocean. It's just so different from other natural sciences, lab sciences, things like that. Southern Ocean, you know, it can take like what, two days of flying and maybe four days of transit to get where you're going. Yeah. And then shipping all your moorings there and back, you know, can take nine months to get spare parts sometimes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's pretty That's <laughs> intense. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. so hard. <laughs> did some of my master's research in the Southern Ocean on uh, seamounts and um, continental shelves off of uh, South America and Western Antarctic Peninsula mm -hmm. and uh, on just distribution patterns of benthic megafauna, sponges and corals primarily, Okay. Uh, using a towed camera. And uh, if you know anything about the Southern Ocean and especially deploying gear off the back of a ship in the Drake Passage or other parts of the Southern Ocean, you know that it's not not exactly calm waters. Um, they have some pretty substantial waves and swell. And running a towed camera system on a yes. seamount. Oh my God, are you serious? Did you actually do that? I, I wasn't physically on the cruise, but I did get to analyze the data. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, I feel like I was there in spirit because <laughs> How many times did you vomit while watching <laughs> yeah, the video? Seriously. Yeah, it, it's interesting, you know. Um, you know, we don't want to throw out any data, but especially from these remote parts, we have to make do with what we have. So, uh, the goal was to fly the camera three to five meters off the bottom, and when you're two thousand meters down, and your swell is thirty feet, twenty feet. Yeah, sure, that sounds right. Something like Whoa. that. You know, one wave is either gonna either gonna put you on the seafloor or way too high. So okay. you have to, yeah, adjust that and fly very carefully. Otherwise, you're gonna <laughs> be doing some sampling. Yeah. So we have to, yeah, we've used some statistics to pick out random images to analyze that we're within our acceptable height off bottom. Yeah. That sounds right.
the C pen there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You have time to take a Yeah, I do. This one looks like a C pen. Go for zoom. Possibly in the genus well say it in the Panatulidae family. Probably a, one of the C pens, not a rock pen. It looks to be pretty well anchored in the sediment. This one's been imaged quite a bit before. I don't know if we have a good idea on it yet, though. How do you feel about doing a collection here? Do you think you can pick it up? Um, is this something we'd normally, normally slurp? Yeah, probably. We can try. We would need the wide? the whole thing, so we need stop to the ship? grab it. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can I dig it out of the uh, the sand a bit? So this one is identified Thank as you. Panatula species yellow, which makes me think it was never collected. I'm open to advice here, Josh. Mm, I I can't I can't recall. Did they did they hold on just to the sand, or are they are they holding onto a rock like under the sand? No, they're not on a rock. It's just kind of it has a balloon shaped peduncle under the sediment. Right. So, so you could almost like dig it up a little bit. You could. I do not have a lot of time to work with here. We got a yeah. huge layback. Um. So you'd want to probably just grab. I'd probably just want to, the best option for me probably is to just grab it. Yep, grab it with with some sediment. Hope you get the base of it. The name of this one is going to be Penachulidae or Panatula species. We don't want to cut it though. Oh, oh, okay. So you want to try to dig up the base a little bit, right? Yeah, you if, you, if you grab it, you should be able to pull it up all in one go. You can pinch it, we just don't want to cut it. Roger. Get those blades out of there. Very nice. Oh, it is on a rock. Mm. Or no, no, not on a rock. Okay. Uh, let's go into the forward bio box on the uh, left hand side, A. Okay. Left hand side. Again, careful opening the box, just in case. Roger. Let's do a little bump out. Uh, yep, do it. Okay. Lovely. Thanks. Close that up. Thank you. Deal with that in just a second.
It looked like it had a root. Yeah, that's uh, it's called a peduncle. Okay. And that's uh, the peduncle that you've been yeah. talking about. Got it. Yeah, it's a it's more like a balloon shaped appendage that they can inflate and use it to anchor in. Kind of like how the the sonardyne actually inflates around the ship. That's a great analog, actually. Yeah, that's a good analogy, I was going to say. What do you mean how the sonardyne inflates around the ship? Well, when we lower it into the moon pool, we have two tires. They're separated maybe a little over a meter, and we inflate and deflate those tires. And when we inflate them, it helps keep everything in place. Oh, cool. OK. I gotcha. Sample number are we up to? That was 45? Okay. Oh no. Oh no. I just mislabeled something. Oh no. Steve, we just might meet, reach the summit on our watch. Typical. <laughs> I, I bear responsibility for that, though. For reaching or not reaching the summit? For not having enough time to have the glory of reaching oh. and, and poking around the summit. We did get a good one last night. Yeah. Bridge, Nev. We can get a move on again, 100 meters bearing 160. Thank you. Thanks, Nav. Good timing. Perfect. I dig it. So, let's lay back. I have this, I don't know. So I have this theory that might be just total nonsense, which is that like 